Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, the series where I show you some photos and then tell you about them uh, frequently whilst mispronouncing the photographer's names. Uh, and this, would you believe it, is episode 16, which means that uh, were this episode a human being, it would now be legally old enough to um, have sex and get married, but not old enough to get a tattoo or vote, which uh, makes you wonder about the strange world we live in. Um, it's been a while since my last episode, uh, and that's because I've been very, very busy. I've been away, I went to New York, and um, I gave a talk in Brooklyn, so thank you very much to everyone who came to that. Um, and while I was there, obviously I took some photos. I was very lucky in that I got to go to the Easter parade, uh, where people were wearing some amazing hats, and I went out and I took some very lovely, predictable photos, uh, like this. And this. But then, just as I was leaving, I saw this hatless couple and took their photo, which gives me a huge amount of pleasure. And also, as someone noticed, they both appear to be holding cameras, which I find fascinating. Maybe a couple of grumpy proto Vivian Mayers, who knows. And the whole thing just serves as a reminder to me to always be looking for the less likely, more unexpected shot. So just because someone is wearing a great hat, it doesn't automatically make for a great photo. Um, the other reason that I haven't posted in a while is because I've been very, very busy with uh, finally launching the Kickstarter campaign for the follow-up book to Sparks, uh, Mostly False Reports. Now that went live a week ago, and at the time of me recording this, it's already raised 58% of the money necessary to make it a reality. So a huge thanks to everyone who's pledged already. Um, the campaign only lasts for 30 days though. So please, uh, if you're gonna get involved, uh, don't delay, just go and do it now. Seriously, just pause this video, go and make a pledge, then come back and you can re watch the rest of this. Um, and obviously the best way to make me shut up about this whole thing and stop blathering on is by helping me get to the total and then I'll never mention it again, I promise. Or maybe once or twice when it comes out. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? Well, um, I've been doing quite a lot of workshops and portfolio reviews and uh, the main thing that a lot of people seem to be asking me is how can they focus their street photography? Because obviously one of the great things about street photography is that it can be about anything. Um, there's no real rules. You can go out there and you might see anything and take a photo of it and that is your inspiration for the day. But how do you maintain that? How do you keep going in the face of the randomness of the world? Because that's one of the things about street photography. It can be overwhelming and a bit scary. Um, and one of the solutions I find to this is by starting a project. If you do a project, it gives you a degree of control or at least the illusion of a degree of control over your work. So that's what I want to have a look at today. Uh, a number of varying photography projects by different photographers that I like, and you, we can see how they've adopted different or similar techniques in order to control and to form a body of work. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a look at projects. So let's do the title thing and then we can dive right in. So if you've watched any of these episodes before, then you'll know that one of my very favorite photographers is the late, great Andre Cortez. And Cortez had a fantastic and yet very simple project that he worked on across his entire career. And it started, I think, with this photo, which he took in Hungary way back in 1915 when he was just 19 years old. And the last photo in the sequence, as far as I'm aware, was this one taken in England in 1980. So that's 65 years later, and there may even be some others, I'm just not sure. And obviously the subject that links those two photos is reading, and Cortez took photos of people reading wherever he went. And the result is a beautiful collection of thematically linked images. I'm showing you just a tiny fraction of my favourites, and some of the best are all collected in this book called On Reading. Now the great thing about a project like this is its simplicity and universality. People read everywhere and they're distracted when they're reading, which makes it easier to take their photograph. Although it should be noted that people are reading less and less in public now. 
at least they're reading fewer and fewer books and papers. And I think there's something far less attractive and less photogenic about people just staring at phones. Also, I would argue that just because Cortez got there first, it doesn't mean that you too can't do a project on reading. Because guess what? Your images will be different to his. I've been photographing people reading for about 25 years now. Here's a few of my favourites. And while they may owe a small debt to Cortez, they're still valid and they're still very much mine. I'm just following in his footsteps. I have no alternative to that, do I? I've also started a kind of side project on myopia, or people reading with the help of magnifying glasses. So it's always possible to tweak and adjust a previous existing project and make it your own. And you know, loads and loads of other great street photographers have worked on projects. Um, one of my favourites is this one by Joel Meyerowitz called Wild Flowers. Again, another very simple idea that you can pursue anywhere, and one that I'm sure probably came to Meyerowitz retrospectively when he realised he had lots of photographs that featured flowers. Then there's Martin Parr, who has more thematically themed projects and books than you can shake a shitty stick at. His first book was called Bad Weather, which was just photos of people out in bad weather. And since then, to name but a few, he's done tourism, bored couples, auto portraits at various photo studios across the world, and even remote Scottish post boxes. One less well-known project that I also really like is this one by Julie Hrudova um, of the grey herons that live in her home city of Amsterdam, and they really do seem to get everywhere. And you know, one photo of a grey heron in an urban environment would be great, but she really goes the extra mile, and the result is this fascinating and unexpected collection of images. Although, alas, I think the little zine of these is completely sold out at Bump Books. So there's nothing that links those projects I've just shown you other than they're all very straightforward and I think they're made just by um, patience and editing really. Uh, however there are lots of other projects out there that are slightly different um, and it seems to me that they are all projects where the photographer has placed some kind of restriction or some kind of rule upon their work and that yields very interesting results. So that's what we're going to take a look at uh, for the rest of this episode. Um, now I'm just going to do it in roughly chronological order um, and the first one I'd like to take a look at is by Paul Fusco. But before we look at the project I just want to very quickly show you this which is a photograph that he took in New York in 1968 and is just so unexpected and weird. Um, although I have to admit it has no relation to anything else in this episode at all. I just love it and I wanted to share it with you. So the same year that he took that super strange dolls being taken into or taken out of the boot trunk of a car, uh, Fusco also uh, did this project, which is called RFK Funeral Train, which was in June 1968. Um, and, or that, I mean, it would be amazing if the, the dolls in the trunk of the car was shot on the same day as this. Well, that would be really weird and a very strange coincidence, but um, I doubt it. So anyway, I'll shut up. Um, so this was a project about the uh, transportation of uh, Following the assassination of uh, Senator Robert Kennedy, his body was placed on a train and the train went from New York to Washington. And Fusco at the time was a press photographer for Look magazine and he managed um, he managed to get on board on the train, um, but he didn't really have a brief. Obviously, he was just told to go and photograph the day um, and he didn't know what he was going to photograph until he sat down in the carriage and looked out of the window. Um, and saw the huge crowds that had gathered to pay their respects. There were up to one million people, in fact, that had gathered there to line the route. Um, so he just started shooting out of that window and he didn't move and didn't stop shooting for the next eight hours. The journey usually takes four hours, but the train was running slowly out of respect and because of the size of the crowds. And as you can see, the result was that Fusco got these amazing shots. Um, which almost look as if they're taken from the coffin's point of view. And what I really love is that quite a few of them are blurry. 
uh, some extremely so, but I don't have a problem with this at all. I think it adds to the effect and to the emotion. It's almost like the photographs are crying or in sync with the feelings of the people they're portraying. Now you can imagine that today though, with today's cameras, they'd all be pin sharp or someone would have applied Topaz Labs AI sharpening algorithm to the bloody things and drained all that emotion out of them. Incredibly though, um, Look Magazine didn't even publish the things when uh, Fusco showed them to them and uh, they effectively lay undiscovered and unappreciated for the next 30 years. Um, so that was the first project, which all got shot um, in one day, just eight hours. Um, and the next project is something similar in that it also takes place over the course of one day and also takes place from a static position, a static camera. This takes truly static, not on a train, um, but they're all taken by a photographer called Anthony Hernandez in Los Angeles and the project is called LA 1971. And this is literally just 12 shots of people coming out of a door, the same door and one that looks like a bank vault. However, they're not bank customers because actually the door they're coming out of is a bar in Los Angeles. And it's fascinating that as soon as you know that it's a bar, that knowledge, that context makes you look at these characters slightly differently. They become almost instantly less respectable. They're drinking during the day. You start to notice that they are all smoking or have toothpicks in their mouths. I love this little sequence. It shows what you can do with a strong commitment to an idea. In fact, when I was doing some research, I came across an interview where Hernandez says he was only stood outside the bar for 15 or 20 minutes in total, which just makes the sequence even better in my mind. Another factor that I've come to realize through doing this episode is that uh, most street photographers spend a huge amount of time walking. I mean, it's arguably one of the only forms of exercise that I do do. Um, but uh, these projects are all like little rebellions by the photographers against walking, against the tyranny of walking. They all involve static cameras. Um, and, you know, that's just what Hernandez did. He stood outside a bar for 20 minutes and took some photos, uh, which is an antidote to walking. Um, it's also worth noticing, no, noting that uh, Los Angeles is a town where apparently no one walks apart from the street photographers maybe, which leads me briefly into another project Hernandez did in the 70s and 80s called Public Transport Areas, where he just went around photographing people who were waiting for the bus. Again, a really simple but effective idea that anyone out there could do and make their own. I imagine bus stops in different cities around the world will always be interesting and always distinctive. So the next project I want to look at um, is this one by the Danish photographer Peter Funch. Um, and this was definitely not a quick uh, sort of one day or few minute project. Um, this one took Peter Funch nine years between um, 2009 and 2016. Um, although it didn't involve any walking for him because every day he would just set up his camera on the same street corner of 42nd Street and Vanderbilt Avenue between 8.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. And what he would do is photograph the commuters that flowed past him. The fascinating thing about this project is that Funch was looking for one thing in particular. He was looking out for the same people, but on different days and different years even. So the resulting book is a collection of diptychs showing people at different times in their lives going to work and how they do similar things even across many years. So we see people going to work wearing the same clothes or combinations of clothes, carrying newspapers in the same way, or drinking their favourite kind of coffee, or just with similar gaits or expressions or gestures. It's a truly hypnotic sequence as you start to compare and contrast these people. And I just love the way it makes you think about work and about how we present ourselves to the world. So that project took a static camera to the same spot over a long period of time and produced some fantastic results. And that's exactly the same formula employed by our next photographer, Hayahisa Tomiyasu, who spent four years photographing the same table tennis table in a public park that he could see from the bedroom of his eighth floor apartment in Leipzig, Germany, between 2012 and 2016. Apparently, the project started when he was waiting to take a photo of a fox but instead he became fascinated by the variety of human activity around the table tennis table. Tomiyasu has said that the project became an obsession 
and that he spent almost the whole four years inside doing little else except looking out of his window, camera in hand, waiting for interesting stuff to happen down below. Which I find both commendable and astonishing. And this is just a lovely, quirky little project. I also think it's fair to state that none of these photographs are truly amazing. There are no classic timeless images here really. But this still works incredibly well as a project because of the cumulative weight of the material. These photographs need each other to work, but together they have meaning. They are more than the sum of their parts. And I think that's true of a lot of projects. A great standalone photo doesn't need support. It can function on its own. But most great photographs are unrepeatable. Projects are where we can find a home for photographs that maybe need a little help. Um, so I want to just take a look at two more projects and they're both slightly different. Um, the first one involves some photographs taken by a photographer called Augie Wren. Um, and if you've never heard of Augie Wren, that doesn't surprise me at all because uh, they are a fictional character. Augie Wren is the lead uh, role in a film by, um, written by Paul Auster and directed by Wayne Wang called Smoke. And Augie is played by Harvey Keitel. So in the film, um, Augie is the owner of a cigar shop in Brooklyn and every day he goes outside at exactly the same time, 8am in the morning, and takes a photo from across the street looking back at his own shop and the street corner in front of it. He's done this obsessively for 4,000 days in a row, unbroken, never going on holiday or missing a day. Now this project is just a small element of the film. It exists to give depth to Keitel's character and it also serves to affect William Hurt's character who catches a glimpse of his dead wife in some of the photographs. But I find it fascinating because it's such a strong idea and it follows exactly the form of several of the real projects we've looked at so far. A static fixed camera in the same place over a large period of time. But it's fictional, it's made up, and I don't know of any real-life equivalent. In an attempt to find out a bit more, I tracked down the actual photographer who took Augie's photographs in the film, and for a few giddy moments I thought that maybe the production had used a genuine project. So I contacted KC Bailey, who was the stills photographer for the shoot, and she explained that all the photographs in the film were taken over just a couple of days around 8am with a group of extras who would switch outfits and they even added coats, snow and umbrellas to mimic the changes in the seasons. So what you see on screen in Smoke is just the illusion or a mock-up of an actual photo project, but it also hints at what is possible if only someone had that kind of manic, relentless desire to create a huge, lifelong project. Well, it turns out there is such a real-life person, and his name is Carl Barden. Now, Carl is a street photographer, but he also does lots of great projects. Many of these also use the static camera over time formula that we've identified in this episode. So he has done work on Coney Island sleepers. This one was way back in the 1970s. Incidentally, I've also been in touch with Carl about his work, and he assures me that at no point did he ever have to straddle anyone to get these shots, but there was quite a bit of leaning forward involved. And then, more recently, for a project called Rising, he stood in one place and shot people who are coming up an escalator. Or he's even used the window of his parked car as a framing device. But none of these can compete with Carl's longest running project, which is arguably the most epic photography project ever undertaken by a human being, which is called Every Day and involves Carl taking a self-portrait every day since February the 23rd, 1987. So that's 36 years or more than 13,000 photographs now, which has led him to be known as the king of the selfie. It's something he's done so often that he compares it to brushing his teeth and is determined to do it until he dies. It's a slightly unnerving experience to look through these photos or to watch some of the little composite films that Carl has put together that show him ageing years in mere seconds. I'm not going to start pontificating about the fragility of life or how these photographs get more poignant as they go on and he becomes visibly older or even about when you discover that he was recently diagnosed with cancer and so you're watching him literally flirt with death. And obviously this isn't street photography, although it is a project that captures a street photographer. And I find it absolutely fascinating because A, because of the determination and conviction to carry something like this through, and B, because he's still doing it all on film. That's right, 
Whereas the easy option would have been to switch to digital, Carl Bowden has decided to stubbornly, defiantly remain analogue. And for that, if nothing else, I have to salute him. Although apparently for the past 12 years, he also shoots a digital backup just to be safe. Finally, in my correspondence with Carl about these projects, he said something which I found to be very profound. And that is, when you start out as a photographer, you almost always begin just by photographing the world around you. But then, over time, you get ideas of your own, and so you start projects to express what's going on inside of you, and effectively to help take ownership of some of these things. And that's exactly what all the photographers we looked at today have gone and done. So uh, that's all for today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope it's maybe given you some ideas about photography projects of your own. Uh, speaking of photography projects, um, please remember to go and have a look at Kickstarter and maybe help me complete my photography project, Mostly False Reports. Uh, remember, I'll only shut up about it when it's fully funded. Uh, so thank you very much if you get a chance to do that. Um, there's a link down below somewhere. Also take a look at the other 15 films that I've made. Uh, they're all there for your delectation. Uh, so that's that. Uh, thank you very much and goodbye.